Welcome back, everyone. You're watching We Heart Therapy, the special series EFT Talk. I'm your host, Dr. Annabelle Bugatti, licensed marriage and family therapist and certified EFT supervisor and therapist here in fabulous Las Vegas. And we're welcoming to our show, Dr. Sharon Chatkup Lee. She is the EFT trainer in Portland, Oregon, and she's the founder of the Portland Center for EFT. And she's joining us today because we are going to talk about the EFT Tango. And Sharon runs a training, a fabulous training on the EFT Tango. And I know this is an area where um, a lot of EFTers can get kind of stuck. So we're going to explore the EFT Tango today. Thank you, Sharon, for being on our show today. Oh, thanks for having me. This is super fun. As a newer trainer, it's like, woo, it's exciting. <laughs> it's fun. And we're so excited to add you to our crew of EFT trainers. Thank you. Thank you. It's really, really nice to be asked. And so tell us, let's start off a little bit because, you know, we talk about the EFT tango all the time, but I never really hear in the, in, in the introduc introductory trainings what the point of the EFT tango is. Can you sort of talk about that for a moment? Yeah, absolutely. For there's a big shift coming in the EFT world, and and the tango is going to be how we orient ourselves moving forward. So, I think that the tango is sort of new on the scene, and in the last couple of years, it's become clear it could be so much more helpful as a way to teach EFT and orient ourselves. So, if we think of the steps and the stages as things to think about what's happening with our couples, and then we think of the tango as how we orient what we're doing. The steps and the stages are them. The tango is us, what we do and how we do it. Mm. And so what it sounds like you're kind of saying is that, so the steps and stages are sort of the information that we want to get from the clients and the EFT tango is the way we experientially go about getting that. That's right. And I think that for many people learning EFT, and I was one of these people, steps and the stages just flustered me and overwhelmed me. And I never... <laughs> I just felt like I wasn't getting it. It's so linear. And in fact, I don't know if you've heard this story, but for a long time, people were trying to get Sue to say, well, why do you do that then? And why do you do that there? And she, there was so much pressure on her. She mm -hmm. said, okay, I'll give you the steps. But she, what she did is she took half the steps are uh, experiential, like mm -hmm. deepening something. And the other half are more cognitive or processing. And she just divided the steps. So I think it's, what is it? The even... I have to think about that. The even are experiencing and the odd are more processing. Well, I think it might be opposite because opposite. step three <laughs> is, is accessing the underlying emotions, right. which is pretty experiential. But That's right. That's I mean, right. They're kind of both. And, and we don't lose the steps and stages. You know, what I think is, you know, with the EFT Tango is it's the way that you move through the steps and stages. And right. You know, I tell some of my EFTers, some of my supervisees, I'm like, have any of you guys ever taken dance lessons? You know, because we always talk about EFT as a dance. And they're like, yeah, yeah, I've taken dance. Well, so it's not like your choreographer teaches you the steps once and then you're just doing this dance, right? It's like they isolate parts of the dance and you may do two, three, four, two, three, four, two, three, four. <laughs> you yeah. know, you'll repeat those steps and repeat them and repeat them and repeat them until you've got them. And so, you know, some of my EFT are like, well, I feel like I'm beating a dead horse. Well, it's, it's really helping because the client digests it in different ways. So, you know, the, the EFT tango isn't linear, even though sometimes even the moves of the EFT tango can feel like a linear circle, if that makes sense. Mm. It's some of my EFTers who feel like, okay, so I'm on step, stage, step one of the EFT tango, right? And then maybe they need to move to deepening an emotion, uh, organizing that emotion, but then a block comes up and they have to go back to tracking that block and, and then moving back, you know, so it's okay to move back and forth, kind of like two, three, four, two, three, four, two, three, four. Sure, sure. But then you, you want to go back towards, you know, the end game of the tango. Can you talk a little bit more about those steps in the tango? Yeah, I think one of the great things about the tango is that it becomes a rhythm, like you're saying with dance, like there's a rhythm to the tango. And once you do it enough and you just have that rhythm, 
then yeah. there's a way that I feel personally freed up. Like my brain is freed up to like, I don't, yeah. I used to have those moments of like, what am I supposed to do next? But now the more I do the tango, I don't worry about that so much because I know I'm going to mm -hmm. focus on a piece of the process, deepen something, hand it over. So let's, let's go through the moves. And I think mm -hmm. it's helpful to call them moves instead of steps mm -hmm. so that people don't get which step, what are we talking about? So yeah. the moves of the tango. So move one is about the process. What's mm -hmm. the process happening? That can, I like to start sessions with uh, the between process. Mm -hmm. what's happening between the couple or my latest, most current understanding of their pattern. Mm -hmm. Then I move into a within part of the cycle. So this is, so this happens and then that happens and then this happens and then that happens, right? That's the between. Now with you partner A, I'd like to go deep, go understand better what happens inside of you in this part of the process. So then I start unpacking the within part. That's I think there's still a lot of discussion about how to think about move one and move two. I mm -hmm. like to think of that within process where mm -hmm. we're unpacking what happens within that person right. as part of the cycle is still move one. Right. Well, and so what I kind of hear is, you know, so I remember Sue said once you learn, okay. you learn the steps and stages and then you lose them. And I like how you said sort of once you know them, you, you don't have to think about them. Your brain isn't busy focusing on what step am I in. So then you can be in the moves of the tango and you're not worried about, okay, like what am I after? You know, like yeah. the steps guide what you're after. And, and like you said, move one, I think, can be correlated with steps one and two of the cycle. And then when yeah. you go, okay, I want to happen, know what happens more within you. That's your accessing those right. underlying reactive emotions and primary emotions. That's your step three. That's and then right. this is, so this is sort of like another point that I figured out about the cycle. And you tell me, Sharon, if I'm getting this right, is that the EFT tango helps us coordinate those new emotional signals between partners helps us coordinate new emotional signals between partners. Um, is that enactment, right? Yeah. When we, when when we get to something new and then enact right. it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, because the tango helps us move into an enactment, ultimately right. is the end game. Right. But really the purpose of that enactment is to help send a new emotional signal that they're not sending right. when they're caught in their negative dance. Right, getting under the cycle. Right, yeah. so if we think of move one, so we, with move one, we've got the process, and then we move into the within, like you're saying, correlating to step three. Mm -hmm. And then step in move two, so I really think the two components of EFT that make EFT work, one mm -hmm. is an awareness, building awareness mm -hmm. with people about their moves, what happens for them. And then the second part is expanding emotional capacity. So move one is an awareness move. It's not a cognitive move. And that's when people say, um, I'm beating a dead horse. I think I say to people, how many times have you had to hear, hear about EFT? I feel like as a supervisor, I repeat myself and repeat myself. And I don't think that's because they didn't hear me the first time. I think that's because we integrate on different levels. We gain awareness. It takes time. Awareness takes time to develop. If we think of it as awareness instead of cognition, I think that opens up a lot of things. Yeah. So then in move two, we're working on expanding that emotional capacity. And I do that first. I invite people, you know, say, would you mind? Would you please stay here? Mm -hmm. You know, can you stay right here? And then waiting, which I think is really hard for a lot of people, but yeah. opening up emotional space, you know, move one, you've worked really hard to sort of paint the picture, the scene of what happens internally now the scene is all laid out in front of us. And now we're saying, will you just walk into that scene and just feel what that's like to be right there? Yeah. And, and then we have to wait and slow ourselves down and go into a different gear where there's room for people to really breathe and feel their bodies and, mm -hmm. um, and find something new, something they don't normally say, something they don't normally talk about when they're caught in their pattern. Mm -hmm. And that's where we find, so that's what we're looking for in move two. And then in move three, that we're handing over whatever it is we've just found. Mm -hmm. So um, we like to do that specifically, not just tell your partner about that, but like tell your partner about that heartbreak or tell your partner about that mm -hmm. emptiness, whatever has come up in that move two. Mm -hmm. And then in move four, now move, when I first started doing the tango, I was 
it was sort of before I heard Sue talking about how this is going to be the new wave of EFT. And for a while, all I could really focus on is one, two, and three. I would just track the process, deepen something, hand it over, track the process, do deepen something, hand it over. And that helped me get a handle on that. And I was just like, four and five are going to have to wait until I can get my head around one, two, and three. And that, I honestly think that helped me a lot. But then when I came back to four and five, I've discovered how rich they are. And now I really love working with four and five. Because I always say when you do an enactment, well, the most like, there are only two things that can happen when you do an enactment. One is the cycle's going to happen. And that's mm -hmm. something we want to happen. We want the cycle to come alive so that it can be present moment focused because that's where we can help people the most is when it's and alive. we can work on it right as it starts to get tangled up it's like yep. as a as a dance choreographer i want to see the steps you're taking and I, I love i started thinking of myself as the therapist as a dance choreographer right yeah. trying to coordinate these two people taking different steps to get on the same page and dance together right. so i need to see what it looks like when you try to dance what steps get off with each other right Yep, we want it to come alive. And also neurobiologically, all those brain centers are open. Like the, uh, all the triggers are happening. So we can work. It's very powerful to work right there. So right. either, so when we do an enactment, either this cycle is going to happen or something new is going to happen. Mm -hmm. Those are really only the only two options. And if something yeah. new happens, then we can process that and make sense of that and, mm -hmm. and cheer them on and say, oh, great, something new happened. And if the cycle happens, then we, we make sense of that. We unpack that. So right in, here, this so, is where you get stuck. This yeah. is what it looks like. <laughs> yeah, right? here it is. It's happening yeah. right now. Yeah. yeah. So I like how you say, you know, it's really predictable. You know, when you start to process the tango, you're starting to go into the tango to try to get them to communicate, to emotionally experience and communicate a new emotional signal to their partner. And maybe, you know, they're still so reactive that something pops up and blocks the way and it's the cycle, right? Yeah. And that's, you know, what we could call a block. It, but that's great, right? All the trainers say, it, even if the cycle comes up, that's still great information, right? It's, it's wonderful, yeah. That, here's a pain source. Here's something painful. Here's something hard. Let's lean in and explore that. Or they're able to do it and you're like, wow, look, see, you guys really do have the capacity to do this. You're doing it right here, right now. Yeah, <laughs> right? yeah. Really leaning into that. I love that. And he talked about, you know, neurobiologically, you know, their synapses are firing, things are opening up. This is what I, I sort of picked up from Scott Woolley, one of our other trainers, is that it's sort of like state-dependent learning. Yeah. When they're at home and they get caught in the cycle, they're not just staying from this totally detached place. There's emotions that are firing, you know, they're, right. they're in that emotional state. So, you know, when we get them in session, it does no good to talk about it from a distance, from this detached right. place because that's not the state from which they're having all this distress. That's so right. we want to help them change states, as Sue calls it, change levels to the place where all that pain is happening and new emotional information becomes available in that place. Right, absolutely. Right, we want them in an open, receptive brain state. Yeah. And that's, that's not easy to get to at times mm -hmm. with people. But the way the reactivity doesn't scare us, right? Because it's a way in to all that, to the openness when, when people are reactive and then they feel heard, seen, understood, attuned to, then right. they, they can be in a receptive place. And that's so powerful because then they're, the reactivity is alive. They're aware of it and they're in relationship with me and feeling safe and understood and attuned to. It's a very powerful way to work. Yeah, it is really powerful. And, you know, you said something really important about, you know, I, I think with the blocks, that's where, because you said, well, we don't have to be afraid when the cycle comes up. But so often I find, especially beginning EFT years, when they start to do an enactment, and they're in the tango, and the client's like, uh -uh, I don't want to do that, you know, yeah. they, they start to freak out a little bit on the inside, and they're like, oh no, <laughs> what do I do? I tried to do this beautiful enactment, I had the client right there, and then it just totally fell apart, 
Can you talk more about that? Oh, I know. It's like we so fall in love with these enactments when we learn EFT and then we want, we so want them to go beautifully. And we think the enactments are a way of fixing something or fixing, people get caught in this idea of like changing the cycle or fixing the cycle mm -hmm. rather than making the cycle explicit. Mm -hmm. And so I think when we go into an enactment with an expectation, oh, this is going to change the cycle. This is going to fix things. Then we're setting ourselves up to be disappointed, but also we're missing the riches of bringing the cycle alive so that we can work with it alive because it's really about being aware, not changing, not fixing. It's about mm -hmm. being aware and then being able to feel our feelings. Those are like the, the core skills that we're actually not teaching people, but helping them develop capacity for. Right. So you're really expanding their emotional window of tolerance, yep. which is where some therapists might run into corners of themselves in this place because their window of tolerance may not Absolutely. be so big. Absolutely. And so it becomes that parallel process knowing like, where do I go in my own cycle if I'm not comfortable leaning into emotion and the client you know, needs to go there? Do I go back into my head and start cognitively processing and then we all move away. Right. We can think the same thing, like as we look at our work, we can use the tango to diagnose our work too. Like, mm -hmm. where am I struggling? Where are my personal blocks? Mm -hmm. Where are my learning blocks? Am I working with the process? What comes up for me when it's time to deepen? Do I get scared around enactments? You know, it's, mm -hmm. I find it very helpful in assessing and diagnosing my own work and my supervisee's work too. Yeah. Oh, I love how you said that part about, do I get scared around enactments? I find that comes up so often for my EFTers who are just learning EFT and they're like, I'm really scared to do an enactment. Can you talk more about the fear that comes up for therapists around doing enactments? Oh, sure. Let's see. I wonder what that is for people. It's sort of like falling into my memory banks of when I when I was afraid of enactments, um, it's getting further away. Um, I think people are afraid to, a couple of things. People are afraid to take charge of sessions. I think mm -hmm. therapists are uh, not exactly trained to be in charge. And if we are in charge, we're in charge in a cognitive way. Mm -hmm. So when we ask someone to do enactment, we're taking a huge vulnerable risk, both within ourselves and saying, I, here's what I want you to do. We're sort of mm -hmm. to putting a stake in the ground of what we think is important. And that's vulnerable for a lot of us. Yeah. But we're also asking the person to do something incredibly vulnerable, which is share something with someone that they don't feel so safe with, who's incredibly mm -hmm. important to them. Mm -hmm. So at so many levels, it's scary. Yeah, that I find, I think some of my supervisees has, have also said that fear of, I don't really know what to do, or if I lead them to this place, I won't know what to do once they get in that place, which, you know, it's like when we lose our footing in the tango, because the tango map does tell us where to go. But if we lose our footing, it's like, I don't know what to do. I got them there. Now what? And now I'm afraid to like stir up these emotions on the inside. Yeah. And, you know, and so I don't want to arouse these deep emotions. And then they leave my office and they're, they're all stirred up on the inside. Right. But people are, going to be stirred up whether we stir them up or not. They're in distress whether we help them or not. It's right. sort of like they're going to be alone and in distress whether we try mm -hmm. to help or not. Yeah. It's they're coming to us because that's already there. So we're not really opening up something that's not there. And mm -hmm. almost in some way, if we avoid going into that emotional place, we can sort of be guilty of joining their cycle because that's yeah. what happens in their negative dance is an avoidance. Yeah going to that deep place where all the pain is. I find it's helpful with the way we feel about pain to think about children. Like if a child is hurting, do we think, ooh, I don't want to go close to that pain and hurt it more. No, we like, like if a kid skins their knee, we're like, we got to get in there, clean the wound, mm -hmm. put something on it, make sure it doesn't have any rocks in it. You know, like we take care of them, we move in, even though we know it might be distressing or painful we also know it's part of the caring yeah. but we forget that as adults we forget that you have to move in with pain yeah it's so beautiful and you know I think often people forget that anger is pain you know so they see 
they see these cues of pain and they're not realizing, oh, there's pain there. Or, you know, of course we're wired to be pain averse, right? Yeah. But pain is such a valuable signal that says, look here, <laughs> something needs attention. Something, something needs important. Care. Yeah. 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 But human, so, human beings are so afraid. We're so afraid of our pain. Yeah. We're so afraid of feeling our pain. And that's at the crux of so much. Like that's why EFT is so much about expanding emotional capacity and really expanding capacity for our pain. Because without that, we can't, it really boils down to we can't talk about our feelings. And when we can't talk about our feelings, we do all this crazy reactive stuff. Right. And And it makes things worse. Some therapists will say, you know, well, I can get my clients to go through the tango, they get their cycle, but. They're not really de-escalating. And I, I think what they're, what I found is that they're saying is that my clients are cognitively talking about the cycle, but they're not really feeling the cycle. Mm-hmm. How can you help bring your client down from just mentally processing to emotionally experiencing in the cycle? I, when people tell me that they're not getting it or it's not taking root, I think there are two possibilities. One is the deepening part. So I'm going to come back to that. But the other option is sometimes people haven't really owned their moves. Sometimes we have snarky, pokey, critical, withdrawing people in our offices, and we're not saying you poke, you get distant. You know, we're not saying those things and making it explicit because we're scared to talk about the reactivity or afraid of hurting them or making them feel shame. So if people don't understand their reactivity and have awareness of it, they can't do it differently out in the world. Right. Which is a way sort of confronting that move, you know, can you give us an example of what helping the client own their moves would look like? Yeah. Yeah. I think about that. I see a lot of supervised supervisees struggle with this, especially with pursuers and pursuers who are critical. Um, And I think we have to lean on our attachment lens. That's what makes this palatable. That's what makes it not shaming. It's like you want your partner so badly and the only way you can find to, to get him or to get her is to poke. Like in that moment, your distress gets so big and, and you want that person so bad that all you, what comes out of you or what it looks like on the surface is, why don't you get the laundry or, you know, it's this laundry list of problems. And so just making it explicit, but putting it in an attachment framework, I think makes it understandable, humanizing, not a bad thing. You know, I also say to people, I'm critical. You know, we, every human, if you sat in my office for a week, you'd see lots of people being critical and withdrawing. It's just what we do. Yeah. So how do you parlay that into an enactment in early stage one? Um, So in early stage one, I want people to, the enactment I'm moving towards is I know you only see my fill in the reactivity here, but what it's really frustration. mm -hmm. But what it's really about is I am longing to be closer to you or I feel Mm -hmm. so alone. That's our first, that's like Mm -hmm. in the steps model. It's a step two, really, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm reaching for you in a way that's not working. I'm poking Mm -hmm. at you because I'm, I'm worried you don't care about me. Sometimes it doesn't have a lot of emotional depth, but it does have the attachment framework that gives it vulnerability. And I think it's such an important move too. You know, what I sort of talk about is that it teases apart the discrepancy between what's seen on the outside and what's really happening deep on the inside. And the more that you distill that and make it very clear with the client's A, it can start to neutralize that threat where the other partner sees, okay, this poking is really about wanting me. If they're poking, there's something I'm missing. Maybe I can invite them into that space. But it also helps the poking partner to realize, to start really, you know, pairing the two that I'm poking because I want closeness. And when I can own that more, then maybe I can get more authentic about the wanting to be close and start talking about that rather than poking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's again, awareness, right? It's so much about awareness. If we don't know, like I see a lot of people when they get stuck and the couple doesn't know that they're getting reactive. They think when they do enactments that are just the pain and not the reactivity, 
then the couple is still really underneath it saying, you're the problem. Until they can say, I see how I contribute to this. They're really saying, you're the problem. You're hurting me. Even crying, vulnerable looking enactments, if they haven't owned their moves, can really be a poke, which is right. tricky we for us as therapists to really see. Yes, yes. And oftentimes you'll hear this, this will sound like, um, oh, well, my partner pissed me off. <laughs> you know, that's why I acted yeah. this way. There's still so much blame in there where they're not yeah. really owning, I'm really hurt by this, or I'm really frustrated. I, I get angry right here. Something happens inside of me instead. It's you did this to me. You made me feel this way. You're to yeah. blame. You're the bad guy. <laughs> right. And even if we start with a client like that and we mm -hmm. start moving through the tango without enough move one, without enough of like, even right now you're saying you hurt me and there's an edge to you right there. Like that's calling out the reactivity and naming it. If we then move for the pain, oh, that's so painful when your partner hurts you and we deepen that and then hand that over, that person still thinks it's the other person's fault. And we validated it in a way because we've only highlighted the pain without naming the reactivity. Right. So you share the primary emotion without attaching the blame to it. And, you know, I tell my clients, like, we don't have to attach blame to it anyway, because, you know, both of you already know whatever cycle you're in, that there was a precipitating factor, right? But mm. we just always can't wait to just jump in and zing our partner and say, you did this, you, you, you. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. It's, so it's easy very tempting. <laughs> yeah. Instead of just owning and and see, this is what I found, you know, in the tango where some of my clients get stuck is that they think that they're being vulnerable on the outside because they're feeling vulnerable. They think exactly. that what they're sharing on the outside must be vulnerable. So yeah. then when their partner reacts to them in a way that doesn't feel comforting or soothing, they take that as a reinforcer that says, see, I can't be open. I can't be vulnerable because of the way you're reacting. And they're not realizing their partner is reacting to their reactivity not of course vulnerability right of course and then maybe we could go back to your question a wise back about um when couples aren't progressing they understand their co their cycle cognitively but aren't progressing and i was saying there are two main reasons i see for that one is they haven't owned the reactivity which we've been talking mm -hmm. about and the other which is i think what your intention was with the question is right. the deepening part yeah they're not uh, they're not experiencing it the cycle in an experiential way. I think for therapists with that issue, the best thing to do is to focus on the present moment cycle. Mm -hmm. The cycle is happening in the room. Can you, can you see it? Look mm -hmm. for an enactment and then watch what happens. And it might be subtle because people try to be good. You know, once they understand mm -hmm. their cycle cognitively, mm -hmm. they try to be good and not do the cycle anymore, but they can't mm -hmm. help it. They can't help it. And they are doing the cycle, but in a subtle way. And if you do an enactment, you should be able to see it. Mm -hmm. And then you can make it more explicit. And so sometimes I think you can even elucidate that by going into how they're, you know, if they're saying, oh, we're good, you know, sort of unpacking and what does that look like? Are you truly doing new moves in the cycle or are you just avoiding? which isn't the, the intervention that we're going for here. Right. Because we still want you to be able to talk about your pain, talk about what's happening for you with your partner and create something new out of that. So it's like, okay, so you're avoiding now. Let's, let's unpack, unpack that and explore emotionally what's happening there. Yeah, or you can go back to, they don't have to have had a fight that week mm -hmm. for you to go back to, the deepest part of the cycle you've already unearthed because we know they're going to fight again and that's okay. Mm -hmm. Or if it's a, an avoidant couple, they don't fight. They just have the distance. So we, we kind of have to have our, uh, we have to carry along our attachment, like deep places that we've gone with people from place to play from session to session. So that in times like that, when they say, Oh, we've had a great week or we think it's all better now, you know, which our couples will do then we have to say, okay, then let's go back to that place we were talking about last time mm -hmm. where you get stuck sometimes because I really want to make sure to help you with that. Mm -hmm. Where you end up feeling completely alone and you end up feeling like you're never going to get it right. Like, yeah. Let's go back there. And I hear that 
therapist light bulb go on that says, I don't want to stir the pot if they're in a good place, right? Uh huh. But, but they're not coming to therapy because of the sunshine and rainbows. They're coming because of where they get stuck. And we need to right. make sure that they're authentically working through their blocks at home or are they just avoiding getting stuck? And yeah. Even sometimes if I find that they've actually done new moves, they say, you know, yeah, we had a really good week. I'll say, okay, help me understand what you guys did differently because we want to do that. And sometimes they will have done things differently and I'll deepen that and mm -hmm. help them start to talk about what was it like to have your partner reach for you differently this week, right? And really be vulnerable with you. And, and it opens up this whole other door or you find out, oh, well, I didn't actually do a new move. I just avoided. <laughs> right. You know? So, right. oh, okay, so help me with that. This part of you that goes, you know, that when this feeling comes up, it's like, I can't talk about it. I don't, I don't yeah. want to, you know, create trouble. You know? Right. Right. Yeah. The other question I like to ask people in those conversations is, so does that mean you've been able to really reach from that place of vulnerability that we've been talking mm -hmm. about and really say mm -hmm. to your partner, I'm getting scared. I need you. Mm -hmm. Like those words, I need you. I'm scared. Most yeah. people, I mean, that's hard to do for any of us. So yeah. that usually clarifies, Oh no, is that, is that what you meant by the cycle being better? No, we don't do that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we usually have a chuckle then. <laughs> And so this is where I hear some of the clients that some of their blocks start to come up and, and then therapists, you know, sort of struggle with this area. And it's certainly someplace that I struggle is when you have those really cognitive, super intellectual, super high functioning clients that say, okay, well, does, you know, we managed to avoid it and it felt better, but I didn't reach down to vulnerability. Why do I need to do that? right? Why, why uh -huh. do I need to go into my emotions? What's the point? Yeah. And, and the question is, do we answer that question or do we let the partner speak to it? I think sometimes I get drawn into answering questions that are better to let them be between them. Me too. That's where I, and then it feels very heady and it's like, then the client can outwit you and yeah. now you're in a battle of wits and you're like, wait, wait a second. What just happened? You're like, I know they yeah. just slipped out of the emotion, but yeah. their logic is so good that I'm like, <laughs> wait, they're talking me out of it. <laughs> wait exactly. Second. But then I know their partner says that I feel outwitted all the time. And so I, it's like, I right. can't even engage with my emotions because they're just going to outwit me and they're never going to get heard. So why share? With people like that, I try to think, my, think to myself, how do I go with this? How do I go with this? And so with that person, I imagine if I had my wits about me, going with them might sound like, um, I get it. You don't want to go there. You don't want to go there unless you have to, right? It's uncomfortable. It's difficult. Maybe it's painful. And so you're kind of saying, if I can get closer to you without going into the mucky waters of my heart and my vulnerability, then I would rather do it that way. If I can and get I, closer to you without getting closer to you. Yeah, without my heart. Yeah. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and then, then we're standing with them and just highlighting, yeah, how hard it is to take those risks. So that's yeah. another, it becomes a way in if we don't get caught into the argument with them. Yeah. Although I do love and a good debate. And so I, I will take the bait sometimes and have a good debate. And I have won a lot of debates against clients, I must tell you, and it doesn't help. <laughs> <laughs> and I've lost a lot and then I feel foolish you know it's like well that wasn't that didn't go as planned you know but I don't want to get stuck I'm like smarter than than a lot of people but I'm not as smart as a lot of people so I'm like oh shoot am I mentally equipped wait we can't go there that's not the point right no and you so, have to go with them you have to find yeah. a way to go with them into their yeah. world and and, and I think you know you said something a few moments ago about you know the partner so it's like maybe in that way you can also turn to the partner and, and open them up and have them talk about what it's like maybe when they feel outwitted or how it feels different to have their partner be vulnerable versus just cognitive and detached yeah yeah you can always lean on the partner especially yeah. especially if you think what's happening is part of the cycle and it usually is then mm -hmm. it's better to let it play out between them so that it's alive in the room. Mm -hmm. 
So did we finish the tango? I think we got to four. Did we talk about five? Maybe, we I don't think we did. We haven't talked about five. <laughs> Let's talk about five, because I think that's, um, that's cool, because <laughs> it's back to the awareness. Um, and again, when I was first doing the tango, I, it was too much to hold. Like I couldn't hold all the things that had happened. Um, but it's gotten much easier over time the more I've done it to go because five is really about let's look at what just happened mm -hmm. and we trace back through the steps if it didn't blow up so big so let's go back to three for a second if it blows up very big I just go back to move one if you don't know what to do go back to move one what's happening right now what's the process mm -hmm. you see right in front of you mm -hmm. if it blows up a little bit but you can make sense of it and put it into the cycle and help them see what's happening right in the moment you're good to go keep moving on through uh, mm -hmm. have them respond you know and move four, and then get to five and say here's what happened you just did something new and then the cycle came alive right here and we learned this about it right. five can turn right into one and then we do another round of the tango, like five, five and one are very similar in that they're at that same awareness level, integration, if we think of it as integrating emotional experience. And that's where we do EFT light teaching, like a sentence or two that helps people make sense of what just happened. That's the version of teaching we do. So that, like summarizing or like Sue used to say, tying a bow on it. Look at mm -hmm. what you just did or look at what just happened. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's a tourniquet bow, right? They're still bleeding a little bit because it blew up really big. But you're like, this is how you guys get stuck. And, and we're seeing it right here, right now. And you're helping me to understand. <laughs> yes. Yes. And then I also would say for moving through the tango, I... The, we can get stuck. We can get stuck like, I don't get the process yet. I don't, or how long do I deepen? You know, I've heard a lot of questions like that. And I think for me, I try to move through one round of the tango in about 25 minutes, 25, mm -hmm. 30 minutes. And I like that format or not format. I mean, I'm not a rigid person. I'm not a formulaic sure. person, but that idea helps me to track, am I moving things along? Did I get to something deeper? Did we, have we done an enactment? And it kind of keeps, lost. it keeps the work flowing. And then I find yeah. with couples in stage one, if they're not crazy escalated, I can do a tango on both sides in one 50 minute session. Yeah. And, and that feels really good to me and to them because of, yeah. they feel like I've lived on both sides of the pattern. I've right. got the whole picture. Everybody did something new. At the end of the session, I can say, look at what you both just did. Right. And it's not an exact science is what you're saying. Is that no way. If it's a really escalated couple and you're really early stage one, you can expect to have less full tango rounds than if you're a little bit farther in the process, you'll be able to do more of the tango more often. And I found that even a lot of my clients will start to anticipate that I'm going to have them share. And I don't even have to tell them, could you turn and share their partner? They just turn and start sharing. I'm like, yeah. sweet. Thank yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's great. It's great when they go along with us. Sometimes they don't. I just was watching a supervision tape recently where someone said, could we just not do that part with the enactment? What is the, you know, like pretty challenging of the therapist. So sometimes we get that too. Yeah. Yeah. And we have to that, be. That uncomfortability yeah. raises up. It says, oh, something's happening here that I'm not quite comfortable with. And we have to be so kind and persistent in yeah. moments like that about what we know makes a difference. Yeah, you know, that looking in each other's eyes makes a difference. Saying things to each other directly makes a difference. Or I lightheartedly sometimes say, well, humor me. You know, just give them, yeah. just humor me. Yeah, like they'll say, well, we do this at home. Okay, great. I, but I'm not with you at home. I don't get to see what this looks like. So can you help me with that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> be tempted to try to slip, slip the knot again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they will. Yeah, or, yeah. you know, okay, so I'll throw this other curveball at you because this has come up for, you know, some of my clients is that maybe I'll move them through the tangle and they'll say, okay, so like we're talking about our emotions, but now what? Like we haven't fixed anything. Right. Right. We just go back to it must seem like fixing is the answer. Yeah. Right. But it sounds like from our understanding of the pattern that fixing is actually part of the problem. It's part of the cycle, not part of right. the answer. 
But I get it that that would come up for you right now because that's what you turn to when you're distressed. You turn to fixing. Like some anxiety probably pops up and says, can we do this at home? Because really what they're coming to us to fix is their connection and we're helping them connect. So to say, oh, so somehow helping you guys feel more connected doesn't quite seem like the fix for these problems. And then you could go back into move one. Help me understand that. <laughs> yeah, you, know? you could go, if you've got time. Let's go into that, right? <laughs> yeah. Or, or the other, go. another option is, well, it looks like you, the fix just happened. It's happening. It happened yeah. when you, when you shared your heart, when you said, you know, how painful it is when you're disconnected. It yeah. happened when your partner said X, Y, and Z. Those are the moments that it's happening. Yeah. That's and the truly, fix. Yeah, what, and that's, I like how you say that, that this is the fix, being able to be more connected, because what I've found, and I've also explained this, you know, to my clients sometimes, is that 99% of the time, we don't want somebody to tell us how to solve a problem. We're quite capable of coming up with solutions on our own. It's we want somebody to be with us right there and navigate the emotions and feel connected as we try to fix it on our own. Or yeah. as you, maybe we need to come up with solutions together, but we get so caught up feeling disconnected that the battle isn't about, you know, finding solutions for this shared problem. It's against each other. So yeah. when we bring you guys back into connection, we neutralize the threat between you guys and then you two can, from a connected place, start to come up with solutions for your own problems. Right. Yeah. The problems I say to people, you're, you're smart people. Mm -hmm. I, I doubt you need me to help you solve these problems. Yeah. What you need me for is to help you have a different kind of conversation. Yeah. And then you'll be able to solve all those problems. No, no problem. Yeah. To help you connect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So and then what would the tangle look like in stage two as opposed to stage one? In stage two, it's the same work, but I think in, in stage one, we spend more time on move one mm -hmm. and, le and maybe less on move two. And, in, and I see it as like moving this way, that the longer we're working with someone, we spend more time in move two and less time in move one as they start to get it, the cycle. Um, so we might move one might look like just laying the groundwork for that having a stake in the ground you know laying out i know in the pattern this is a place you've talked about where you feel so bad about yourself like you're the problem you have to fix yourself you're not bringing the right things to this relationship can we go there can we stay there and really feel into that place yeah. and then i'm gonna do two three four two three four two three four two three four, two, three, four in in a stage two session right so feel it deeply for 10 minutes 15 minutes hand it over feel it deeply hand it over feel it deeply hand yeah. it over yeah and i really like you want to really stay there i i sort of talk about um deepening the emotion like making a cup of tea right and i know some of you guys aren't tea drinkers but i love tea and I think if you just put your, your tea bag or your tea leaves in the water for like a second, you just get this nasty, like you really don't get a sense of the flavor. It's just like slightly tinted water, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if you, if you let the tea bag or the tea leaves really sit in the water and steep and get hot and really start to percolate, then the flavors become bold and rich and really alive. And you get this real flavorful cup. And that's what you're really looking for in that emotion is that the emotion is so deep and alive that everybody can taste the flavor. And that's what oh, you yeah. want your partner to be feeling is to get a flavor of what that is happening on the inside. Yeah, absolutely. To feel it deeply takes time. Yes. We have to go slowly. We have to make space. We have to really ask people, will you feel that right now with me? Yeah. We have to be willing to feel into it ourselves. Yeah. That's a yeah. big, it's a big ask. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And so let's just reflect back, you know, just to resummarize the tango. So move one is really where we're starting to organize what's happening. Like, and you can sort of think of this as like, 
step two of the cycle, or this could be step five in stage two. You're just organizing where are we at, what's happening, whether this is a place we get caught, or I really want need to reach and ask for love, but I don't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. right? Really just unpacking what's happening, organizing it, and then move two of the tango is starting to understand the emotional content, like really assembling feel it. Yeah, deepening that emotion and then, you know, really trying to get them into it and then move three, the tango. This is where we're asking them to hand it over to their partner. Yep. To, you know, so we've deepened the emotion in move two. That could be like step three or, you know, step five, six in stage two. And then step three, we're handing it over. That's the heart of the enactment, right? And this is where blocks, either the client will go where you want them to go or they won't. Either is really good information, right? One is pain, one is we're ready to move. Um, it's really good either way. And then move four is processing. Okay, so what was it like to share? What was it like to feel your processing? What just happened, right, with the couple? What did this feel like? Sort of deepening and really still allowing those flavors to be alive. And then you move that into step five is where you're sort of summarizing, bow tying, organizing again. This is what we just happened, whether the cycle just popped up right here, right now, and we understood this is what comes up and gets in the way. Or look at this cool new move that your, that your partner just did or that you guys did together and that felt really awesome. And then you can, you know, work towards going back into move one of the tango again. And did I miss anything there, Sharon? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you got them all five moves. Yep. Perfect. And then, um, you know, depending on where the clients are in their EFT sessions and their work, how escalated there are, will impact how many enactments, how many tango rounds you might be able to get through. Yep. It's not an exact science, you know, though I love how you talked about sort of tracking yourself, like after, you know, around 25 minutes, if I'm not moving through it, you know, it's time to check in and sort of, am I getting lost somewhere, you know, yep. if I lost my footing and then get regrounded and try to get back into the tango again. Um, but, you know, don't, don't put all this pressure on yourself, guys. Be like, oh, my God, like, I'm not doing that. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Just, you know, really the tango helps us simplify things, right? That's what it's yeah. supposed to be, simplifying yeah. so yeah. that we can be less in our heads, so we can be yeah. more present in the moment. Yeah. And if we mm -hmm. know, you know, again, we don't, we're not throwing out the steps and stages of, of EFT because that tells us what information we need to get in the trajectory from start to end of EFT, but let's say maybe I don't have a sense of my clients step two, three, and four. I don't know their primary emotions in the cycle. I haven't gotten that, you know, the attachment, connected that to the attachment frame and put that back into the cycle. So then I'm going to isolate that part and put it into the tango and I'm just simplifying it. I'm taking one nugget and I'm just going to be with that nugget in the tango. And I really right. want to get that primary emotion and really, to me, that step four is like, really should be a step 1A, 2A, 3A, 4A, 5A, 6A, like attaching it back to the relationship and the attachment needs and longings and fears just really underpins every single move of the tango to me, you know? Oh, so yeah. I, so much I, happens in move four. Yeah. So I don't even like really think about that move so much because I've learned like that just comes along with everything, every emotion, every move. I'm constantly trying to, I sort of put it through the attachment meter, which is me. And I, I <laughs> you know, or like that uh, attachment decoder, you, you feed your behavior or your statement into me and I'll reframe it back out as something attachment, right? I'm right. feeding it through that attachment meter. And I'm organizing it, right? But if I'm just going for that primary emotion, move one of the tango, move two, move three, I'm having them hopefully turn and share that move, you know? So you just make it simple on yourself. Just take mm -hmm. that one thing and just stay with that. Through the mm -hmm. cycle, through the, exactly. Through the tango. We're really using that one thing and moving through the tango. Really, I think four opens up a relational 
present moment experiential space where so much can happen. That's, I think move four is where all the rewiring happens because everybody is open. There's new awareness. Something's been felt more deeply. Yes. You know, that saying, um, make the implicit explicit, the explicit relational and the relational becomes transformative. That's really what the tango does. Yes. It really moves through that, that whole. I love how you bring it back to that, you know, making the implicit explicit. Because I also tell my EFT therapist, like, it does no good if you get the cycle in your head. (laughs) You know, if you know what's happening, the clients also have to know what's happening, right? And I sort of, you know, the way I explain making the implicit explicit is like, pretend we're like show and tell, you know, like back in kindergarten, you know, which was really fun. You're putting everything out onto the carpet in the middle for everyone to see, and we're going to just be with that all together, right? Put everything on the carpet, and let's make sense of it together and organize it together. We don't want to keep anything hidden or tucked away. We want it to be all out in the open so we can make yeah. sense of it. And I really love, you know, that move three and four of the tango is really, you know, helping those new emotional signals become clear you know, whether it's owning a part of the cycle or helping, you know, inviting each partner to understand something about themselves or something about their partner much more deeply experientially and through the attachment frame. Yep. That's, you know, transformation is happening here, you know. Right, exactly. Yeah. So, and I know that there's so much we could we could go on for days about the tango and I know you teach a workshop and you also have a training for therapy for supervisors, EFT supervisors on teaching the tango, which is fabulous. So can you talk to, can you tell everyone where they can find you, your trainings, website, such? Absolutely. I'm, uh, we're at Portland center for EFT, PCEFT.com. And my site is drsharonlee.com. And let's see, what do I have coming up? I'm doing ongoing workshops here for my community around the tango. Um, and I'm going to offer maybe something online. You'll find that on PSAF for ongoing. I'm thinking of it as an ongoing tango study group mm-hmm. where we work with the moves and really kind of slow things down and study them more and get the rhythm of it. Um, going to do some more with supervisors. And then Another piece that we're doing with, I'm doing with two supervisors, uh, Christina Jackson and Rachel Thomas and I are going to offer a community, su- community leader support group for folks who are leading EFT communities. Having been in that position myself, and the three of us are from three very different communities, we really see the lack of support for community leaders. I wanted to offer a place for us to really... Um, share with each other what the challenges, the joys, the struggles of being a community yeah. leader are. So Which that's something I'm, I'm really excited about it. Yeah. I it love feels- that. Cause even though you may not be like qualified to be an EFT supervisor or you may not be a state supervisor, you could be the, you know, primary most seasoned EFT or in your area and yep. you're leading a community and you still have to know how to help each other grow and learn EFT. So it's yeah. very powerful. I'm so glad that you're doing that. I'm excited about it. We're really going to, we're really going to tr- ask the question, how does an organization or a community really, how can we be more EFT? How can we be accessible, responsive, engaged in our, in the way we lead community and the way we organize ourselves. So I'm excited yes. about it. Excellent. And, and then, then we have our, we have our externship and core skills coming and in Portland. So we'll be doing that in the fall. You can find all of that at PCEF. PCEF. Okay. And then also are any of your trainings listed on ICEF as well? The externship is. I'm not sure about the tango stuff, but that's easier to find at PCEF. Okay. Awesome. And then folks, if they want to maybe schedule you to come down to their community and have you do a workshop, they can contact you through PCEF or through oh, yes. your website. Thank you for reminding me. I'm going to be in LA in October doing a full day uh, workshop for just on the tango. And there's talk of going to other places as well. So nice. keep, keep an eye on PSEF. Yeah, if you want help with the tango and integrating into your community, let me know. I'm happy to support people. Excellent. Thank you so much, Sharon. We really appreciate you being on our show and all of your help and your expertise. And I'm going to make sure that we put the links to your websites in the description for this video on YouTube. 
And guys, thank you to our therapists for watching We Heart Therapy and the EFT Talk series. Our videos are getting 10,000 views and more. So thank you guys for, for watching and staying tuned and supporting. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out if you have ideas for video topics. You know, always happy to take suggestions. But in the meantime, guys, make sure that you follow Sharon, that you hit her up online, that you look at her websites and get in touch with her or attend one of her trainings. And if you haven't already hit subscribe, make sure that you do so now because more videos are on the way. Mm -hmm.